So this is what we have to do. So this is what we have to do. So this is what we have to do. Contribute in a way that we never thought we could. Really make it something thrilling and wonderful. And that's why I love to tell the story of, of Ella Bailey. So there was a plea was on to complete this temple through sacrifices. And Ella Bailey had saved a thousand dollars. She had a little pension and uh, nothing else much, but she was getting along. And she saved a thousand dollars to bury herself with because there was nobody else to bury her. And she thought she should be buried. <laughs> so she had a thousand dollars for a little plot of ground and a stone. She had a wonderful sense of humor. And so she, she said, she, and then a message came about this work, and she, she wrote a letter to the National Assembly. Mr. Iowa told me about this when we sat in Haifa one evening, when the beloved guardian had been talking about Ella Bailey. And the words of love he used were so tremendous that I was deeply moved. When we went upstairs, Leroy said, Do you remember Ella Bailey, Bill? And I said, Of course I do. I served with her in the Assembly. Then he told me that she was the woman that this had happened to. I'd remember the story at the convention, but he left out all the details. Someone had sent $500. They saved $1,000 to bury themselves. It was Ella Bailey. She'd been thinking it over, and she thought, well, she's a small woman. Maybe the plot could be shrunk up a little. <laughs> and Ella Bailey is not a big name. You can get it on a small stone. So she'll send, she says, I'm dividing it down the middle, 50% for Baha'u'llah and 50% for Ella Bailey. So $500 for the other stone that's going up at Wilmette and I'll bury myself with $500. Right at that time came a message from the Guardian about the temple, its significance, and all of the outpouring of what it meant, and how the people would gather from these institutions at the hour of dawn. They would pray, they would supplicate Almighty God, and with that spirit generated in their hearts, they would go out into the institutions of the world and carry on their everyday workaday world. This is the spirit of our faith. That is, the life throbs and it goes right back up. And it is so tremendous, it is inconceivable to try to understand it. That's why we're told only the future will understand it. The Guardian said we can't even understand the full implication of the Master's will and testament. But we're beginning to get a glimpse of the great wonder of it. Well, this was the message about the temple. But well, Ella Bailey read that and she got so moved by it, she thought, well, the stone that I'm going to put over my grave is not too important. The important stone is the one that's going up at Wilmette. So she sent the other $500. And she said, and Mr. I was told the story, she said, I've been thinking it over, and after all, the stone that goes over my grave is not important. But the stone that we're raising in Wilmette is wonderful, and I think maybe Baha'u'llah someday will look down and love at that temple, and he'll see a little corner of concrete and quartz, and he'll say, that's the stone that's for Ella Bailey. So she said, I'm sending you the other $500, and they can bury me in the potter's field. Well, it was very moving. The story continued. 1953 came, and her pension gone on. She saved a few more dollars. Enough that she's thinking of going pioneering, but now she's 88 years old, and she's a cripple in a wheelchair. She's at the Intercontinental Conference, and Rohi O'Connor has read the message from our beloved guardian. And you know how great love he had for everybody. There was no one, uh, neophyte or veteran, white or black, red or brown, young or old, informed of all the teachings, and nobody has left out those who should arise and go because of the great love of God that was a part of this great crusade. Rohia Khanum read the message, and then later she added in her own words a very stirring statement. In one place she said, you'll remember, she talked about the young and the old. Nobody's too young or too old. She says, let the old people take their moldering bones to a far land. Well, Ella Bailey is sitting there 
88 years old, crippled and in the wheelchair, and Robert Gulick told me this part of the story in Africa at the Kampala Conference. He and his wife took Ella Bailey pioneering. She paid her way. She'd saved up enough money to go. But she said to him, she said, Rohir Khanum is talking to me. She says, there's nobody in this whole Medina temple whose bones are as moldering as mine. <laughs> Which was pretty true. She says, if they were moldering anymore, I, I wouldn't be here. But she says, she's talking to me and I'm going to go. She says, I've saved up enough again from my pension. I got enough to get over there. She says, I can eat in Africa what I'm eating in California. I can be in a room there as well as a room in California. I can sit in a wheelchair in Africa, can I? As well as sit in a wheelchair in California. If only I could find somebody to take me. Robert and Mejia Gulick took her and she went to Tripoli at 88 as a pioneer. And unhappily, many of the friends didn't understand because they weren't again in the flow of this tremendous thing. And when you're in the flow of it, you know that everything is normal, that we think of as miracles. Everything is possible. And you're so filled with love that Mullah Hussein, when he grabbed up the sword, you know, and he said, Ya Sahib was a man that he'd conquer the world. When the Bab announced himself, he said he was so filled with power. If all the earth were leaned against him, alone, single, with his weak frame, he'd withstand them all. Well, this is the feeling you get when you get in the flow of this. And this is the feeling Ella Bailey had. So they took her. But some of the friends didn't understand. And unhappily wrote and said, isn't it a shame about Ella Bailey? Wasn't it a pity, the poor old lady, sick and crippled, and she went to Africa and she died there and never taught anybody. That's true, she didn't. I heard the guardian say that. Never taught anybody. Wouldn't it have been better if she'd stayed in California where at least she could have a telephone there and contact the friends by phone? They could come and see her and she could teach somebody. I mean, at her age, that's not right. <coughs> there are some things that the people shouldn't do. It was an unfortunate mistake, they said. These are things that are only in every individual heart. But when the power of the love of God flows down into the heart and it happens to you, you know there is nothing you can't do. And that's the way Ella Bailey felt. And I was at the table for the last half of the story when the beloved guardian one evening rolled out this piece of paper and on there was designed a monument to be raised above her head in Tripoli. He was supervising its construction. And he began to talk about Ella Bailey. The words of love and warmth and kindness that he showered on this little old lady were so great. You would have done anything in the world to have him talk about you for 10 seconds the way he talked about this woman. Tiny and old, a crippled 88 in a wheelchair. I always say she looked like a dried dandelion. And you blew the top of it, she just vanished. She was so little. She went to Africa. The beloved guardian said, she never had time to teach a soul. She died there. But he said, by her going, in the face of all obstacles that anybody would say you could never go, she never thought of them from the beginning of her service to the car she went. She said, that life will be an example that will teach for years to come. People who never ever thought of going pioneering will rise up and pioneer because of the name of Ella Bailey. People who were dead, he said, would come to life just hearing about her story and hearing about her name. It will be an example of living and of love and of sacrifice, he said, that will last for years to come. And that is why he said, I feel it's such a blessing and a privilege to be able to supervise the monument that will be raised above her head in Tripoli. The woman who said, let them bury me in the potter's field. And then the beloved guardian set that wonderful cable to America. And he said, by going at this age in her life, she had consecrated the soil of the African continent. <clears throat> And at the age of 88, she had won for herself the crown of a martyr in the faith of Baha'u'llah. And more, that she had shed imperishable luster 
upon the American Baha'i community. And this, my friends, fellow servants in the great faith of Baha'u'llah, this is the spirit of love and sacrifice that we must find in our hearts to whatever degree we get. Whatever we are today, we must be something different tonight. And whatever we are tonight, we must be something different tomorrow. The days of your lives are come and gone. And the moments of your lives, Baha'u'llah said, soon are dissipated and, and lost. And all too soon we're laid to rest beneath a canopy of dust. What can we then achieve and how can we atone for our past failure? Appreciate the days in which you live. They will come to you no more. And you will never have a like opportunity. And you will never have a like opportunity. And you will never have.